Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Gloria Isabel Giraldo Calderon and I will be one of your instructors today. Uh, before we get started, let me introduce you to Dr. Marianne McDowell from the University of Notre Dame, who is one of the three co-PIs of the ViewPath project. Thanks for being with us today, Marianne. Hi, Vector Basers. Thank you, Gloria. Um, as Gloria mentioned, I am one of the joint PIs of ViewPath PD, of which Vector Base is a part of. Uh, welcome to the last in a series of four webinars on how to use the new resources in VectorBase. So as you probably all know, the legacy VectorBase site has now been retired. So thanks for joining us to find out more about the new resources. VectorBase merged with the Bioinformatics Resource Center UPathDB, and that now we became ViewPathDB. So now we have genomic resources for vectors and eukaryotic pathogens. Um, we started the merging process in September of 2019, and it's now complete, at least for the vectors. Um, and this combined resource leverages the strengths from both VectorBase and UPathDB, including the best tools and resources, as well as the merger of the staff and outreach personnel, uh, which will result in improved service to both vector and parasite communities. ViewPathDB isn't just a database, rather it's a knowledge base, uh, providing not just data, but tools that allow you to analyze data in the resource, and you can upload your own data and analyze it with our tools, which is the topic for today. The ViewPathDB staff is extremely dedicated to making the best resource possible, uh, so please do not hesitate to reach out to us uh, at any time. Uh, and we'll get back to you uh, very quickly. So I hope you enjoyed today's webinar and I look forward to working with you all in the future. Thanks again, bye. Thank you, Marianne. Okay, now some logistics. This webinar will last for about one hour or less. Um, this is the outline for today. The main goal is to answer your questions. Our topic is how to analyze your own data in vector base. And we will demo that using Galaxy and the VectorBase website. Omar, Marianne, or Katrin, uh, please let me know. Are you able to see my second slide now? Yes, it's moving. <clears throat> Great, thank you. Okay, so not only during this webinar, but always the outreach team is ready to answer your questions and hear your feedback using all these communication channels. The email, uh, contact us link, the page uh, chat, and social media pages from Facebook and Twitter. And this here uh, is a screen of how uh, this looks to you as an attendee. At any time during the webinar, please type your questions in this box. These questions are private, and other attendees cannot see them, and the outreach team in the background is ready to, to answer them for you. We are recording this webinar and the video will be up in our YouTube channel um, in, in a specific playlist that we call uh, webinars. And I will also link that uh, to our webinars page and this is how you can get to that. There are three steps, go to the top menu, click help, learn how to use ViewPath, webinars. And notice that this uh, here is, is the path showing you how to get there. And with the check marks, I have just marked the four events for this vector-based mini-series that, as Marianne said, today is the last event. As described in the invitations uh, that we sent out, uh, this is an introductory webinar series, and we are using vector-based as example. But because the layout of all the ViewPad sites is the same, you can do anything that we are going to demo in any of the other parasite or fungi sites using different data sets, but the same tools and resources, as Marianne said. Uh, if you scroll to the bottom of the page, these are the links to the other site. Uh, here, for example, this will be the one uh, for ViewPath. Uh, the icons here on the right are for other uh, sites that are related to the project, but the layout is a little bit different. So Ortho-MCL, uh, you can use to investigate gene homolog relationships of all the genes in the parasite, fungi, and vector-based websites, and even genomes outside of these genomes. CleanEpi for the exploration and analysis of epidemiological studies, 
and Microbiome Database, which is a data mining platform for interrogating microbiome experiments. Uh, today, the instructors are listed here. Katrin uh, from the University of Glasgow, Omar from the University of Pennsylvania, and I, Lord Isabel, from the University of Notre Dame. Katrin will give us a background about what is differential expression in RNA-seq, and Omar and I will demonstrate the functionality using both uh, Galaxy and Vector Base. For this webinar, we have three handouts, which I will upload uh, for you in the same uh, webinars page. And along my presentation, I will be uh, using them so, so you know you can follow along later at your own pace. I can see my first slide, so that's a good start. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So uh, welcome everybody. Um, I'm Catherine and I'm a bioinformatician at the University of Glasgow um, and also a developer on the ViewPathDB project. Um, and, uh, as Gloria said, today we're talking about analysing your own data in vector base and we're using RNA sequencing as an example. So to start out, I'm going to talk a little bit about what the processing um, pipeline for RNA sequencing looks like so that when you start doing this in um, Galaxy, uh, you can understand what you're looking at and what you're doing. So we could think very briefly about why we want to sequence the transcriptome. Go to the next slide. Yeah. So um, often when you ask people this, they just say straight away differential expression. And that's captured in the second bullet point here, which is functional studies for conditions such as stress or drug resistance. But it's important to realize that there's other things you can do with RNA sequencing too. Um, and one of those things is that it's actually very important for gene model prediction. Um, so you can capture a full and completely unbiased repertoire of all the transcripts in the genome, or that come from the genome, sorry, um, even without knowing what they are in advance. And you can use that information to help you decide where genes are and what those genes look like. So for example, where the introns and the exons and the UTRs are. And you can also go as deep as you like. So if you really want to, you can start exploring alternative splicing and more complex patterns of expression and regulation as well. Uh, next one, please. So just to outline how this works, in vivo in your system, you have DNA in a genome. So that's the black, black line at the top, that's your genome. When a gene is transcribed, you initially get pre-mRNA. So that's an mRNA that um, covers the whole gene and still has the introns in it. And then as, as, the, as the gene is transcribed, those introns are spliced out and you end up with a mature mRNA that's been capped and polyadenylated and where the introns are gone. So we'll start by taking that mRNA, extracting it, um, and fragmenting it in a lab. And you can do that using enzymes or you can do it mechanically. Um, there are lots of different ways of fragmenting it. We do a reverse transcription, so we'll end up with the same fragments, but now we'll have double-stranded cDNA, and then that's what we sequence. And we use a high-throughput sequencing method, um, so for this kind of analysis, you normally use Illumina sequencing, and that gives you lots and lots, um, tens or hundreds of millions of very short reads that come from these fragments. And then we process that by aligning it to a genome. And so in this diagram, you've got the reference genome along the bottom, and then the black bars represent where reads are aligned. And as you can see, you can use that information to rebuild the information about the genes. So you can see here that where the reads align corresponds to where the exons are. So you can use those to determine what your exons look like. And you can also see for the, for the middle exon, the number of reads that align is lower. And you can infer from that that sometimes that exon is included in the mature mRNA and sometimes it's not. So you can begin to look at things like alternative splicing as well. Next one, please. So when you're doing these experiments, there's always some considerations to think about. Um, so firstly, if you click next, do you have enough bio biological replicates? And we'd always recommend at least three. If you can afford more, that's, that's great, but three is really a minimum. Do you have enough mRNA? So if you want to capture rare transcripts, 
you need to sequence more deeply to make sure that you capture those when you make your library. If you're if you're only interested in um, very common events, then um, you don't need to sequence quite as much. Also, is the RNA what you want? So if you're sequencing clinical or environmental samples where you might have other organisms, so from a biopsy, from for example, you probably have um, host, um, or, or, or if you have um, an infected mosquito, you want to make sure you've got enough mosquito as well as the parasite. Um, so you need to consider the abundance of the organism you're actually looking at relative to other organisms. You need to think about your selection methods. So um, it's very common to do a poly A selection, but if you're some, there are some non-coding RNA species that actually don't have a poly A tail. So you need to consider if the selection method you're using is appropriate to find what you want. And you need to consider if you're interested in understanding which whether your RNA originates from the coding strand or the non-coding strand. So the non-coding strand can help you understand things about, for example, um, regulation from antisense RNAs. Um, and you can get stranded library kits that allow you to distinguish whether your reads come from the coding or the non-coding strand of your cDNA. So if you're interested in that, you need to make sure you use one of those kits. And then lastly, of course, controls. So um, that's obviously very specific to the experiment you're doing, but you always need to think, do I have the controls that will enable to, that will allow me to answer the question I'm trying to ask? Okay, next one. So when we do RNA sequencing, we can learn two things really. One of those is gene model prediction. So at the top here, what we have is um, a view of an RNA sequencing data set in JBrowse. Um, so we have two genes, um, a long one on the left and then a shorter one on the right. And underneath those, we have RNA sequencing from two different samples. Um, so if we just concentrate on the upper sample for the moment, you can see a couple of things here. So first of all, you can see that where the introns in the gene are, it corresponds to gaps in the coverage in the RNA sequencing. You can also, it doesn't show up very well on here, but if you look just above that, you can see there's a tiny little bar in the middle of the circle. Yes, there, thank you, Omar. Uh, and th what those are, are reads that cross the intron junction. And we'll look at those in a bit more detail late, later, but those can be really informative in determining exactly where those introns are. You can also see the UTRs. So if you look at the three prime end of this gene, you can see where the gene model stops, but you can see that the coverage actually extends. And so there's probably three prime UTR associated with this gene that isn't, isn't annotated. And the same for the adjacent gene, there's probably a little bit of five prime UTR there as well. And although there's not a good example on this screenshot, you, as we saw a couple of slides back, you can also learn about differential splicing from coverage as well. Next one, please. So the other thing we can learn is differential expression. And that's that's obviously what we've what most people are interested in. Um, and you can learn about how thing how um, expression changes both within and between samples. So if you focus first on the top sample, um, you can see that the left hand gene, um, the coverage is fairly even all the way along the gene and it's relatively high. If you look at the right hand gene, you can see that the coverage there is much lower. And so we can already say that the, the, the left hand gene is transcribed more abundantly than the right hand gene. If you then compare the upper sample to the lower sample, you can see that that right left hand gene is quite abundant in the upper sa sample, but actually it's not transcribed at all in the lower sample. And so looking at this is, is basically what differential expression is. It's comparing genes um, and their abundance levels between samples. So how do we actually get there? Can we go to the next slide? So when you get data back from a sequencing center, you basically just get sequenced. So how do we go from that sequence to learning this information? So there's two things you can do with your sequencing data. One is to align it to a reference genome. And the other one is to do a de novo assembly. Um, all the methods we're going to talk about here are based on alignment. 
and once you've once you've aligned your reads, you can visualize them, which is what we were just looking at. Um, it says Artemis there, which is a desktop uh, viewer, but we, we, we can also do this in JBrowse within Vectorbase. You can look at gene models using tools like StringTie, or you can do what we're going to do today, which is differential expression. And then from differential expression, you can take your lists of interesting genes and go on to do functional analysis, which I think Omar is going to talk about a bit later. So this is what the pipeline looks like. And I'm going to leave this um, pipeline down the left side of the screen so that you can stay orientated while I talk through what's happening. Just briefly, this is what your data looks like when you get it back from the sequencing center. So this is a format called FASTQ. Um, if you've done paired end sequencing, which most people do for RNA-seq, you have two files, one for the first read in the pair and the other for the second read in the pair. And the data has three parts to it. So the top part is a header header row. It has some information in it that comes from the sequencing machine, which you don't really need to know about. But the important thing is that it's unique for each read, but it's shared between the pairs. So that, that's how the software tracks which, which reads belong together. Underneath that, you have the sequence. And I hope that's clear to everyone what that is. And then. Underneath that, you have a row of um, qualities. So what these are is they are the probability of an incorrect base call. And they're represented as a negative log 10 of that probability. So if you look at the table down on the bottom right, you can see that if the probability of an incorrect base call is 1 in 10, the quality score we see is 10. If it's 1 in 100, the quality score we see is 20. Is one in a thousand, the quality score we see is 30 and so on. And then um, in just in order to keep the file size small, we re-encode those using letters from the ASCII table. And, and the, the, the main reason for that is to keep the files smaller and to um, enable computers to read them better. Um, but just so when you're looking at these, you know what that line of letters is. OK, so obviously you get millions, potentially hundreds of millions of those rows back in your file and we can't read them all manually. So we need to do some kind of quality control, but we need to do it in an automated way. And for this, we use a piece of software called FastQC. And FastQC will read your FastQ files and it gives you information back about um, things like the overall sequencing quality, which Omar's highlighting there the GC content of your sequence, that can tell you if there's contamination, um, if, how many ends there are, so how many um, bases there are in your read that just didn't get called, um, and whether there's any overrepresented sequences or adapters. And what you get back is an HTML file that you can just open in any web browser. So the really important thing from this is the sequencing quality, which is that plot at the top with the green, yellow and red. And we'll look at that in a bit more on the next page. So that usually this is more typical of what you would expect from a quality plot. So what we're looking at here is on the, the X axis is the position in the read. So we have the five prime end of the read on the left and the going across to the three prime end on the right. And in each position, what we're looking at is the distribution of the quality scores for all the reads. And you can see that as we go from left to right, the average quality decreases as you go along. And that's really typical of Lumina sequencing. But the poor quality at the three prime end can make it difficult to map these reads. So the first thing we normally do is we run a trimming tool. And what that does basically is it just removes the poor quality bases from the three prime end of each read. And it'll check for any reads that are too short and it'll discard, discard them if, they, if they're too short to map after you've cut the poor bases off. If you just flip to the next slide, the other thing that it can do, that the trimming tools can do, is remove adapter sequence. So it, on the right, we have the structure of a paired end fragment. So the red is the fragment of cDNA that you're sequencing uh, with blue and black adapters on the ends. We use the adapters to prime and we sequence a short, a short piece from each end. But if your fragment is short, what can happen is actually you start sequencing there and you carry on 
and you go all the way through and then you start sequencing the adapter at the other end. And so trimming tools can also find and get rid of that adapter contamination as well. So it's always really important to run a trimming tool because it really helps to optimize your alignment. OK, so the next thing is to align the reads. And when we're aligning, we need to be sure that we can do it in a reasonable amount of time and with a reasonable amount of memory. We don't want to be using some supercomputer every time we do an alignment. And so we don't do exact alignments like you would do if you're doing a pairwise, because it would just take far too much memory to do that. Instead, we use something called an heuristic, which means that it's sort of a rough estimate that's good enough for what we want, but it's not perfect. And the way this works is um, is what you can see here. So if I asked any asked someone to align these two sequences, what normally happens is that people pick out that in the top sequence there's a motif which is G A A A, and in the bottom sequence that same motif appears twice. And so what people will do then is they will build two alignments and for both of them they'll do it by aligning that GAA from the top sequence to one of the two options from the bottom sequence and then extending that alignment outwards putting gaps and mismatches in where they need to and that's pretty much how alignment tools work as well as it is it's a theory it's a algorithm called seed and extend and the only difference is that that they um they take kamas rather than rather than patterns that they find visually but when you do this, you can get lots of potential alignments. So we need to decide which one's the best. And for that, we use a scoring system. And the scoring system does vary between alignment tools, but the, the one I've put on the right here is fairly common. So one for a match, minus one for a mismatch, and minus two for a gap. It, for these two examples here, they're both pretty poor alignments, but if you add them up, alignment one scores minus four, and alignment two scores minus 10. So in this case, we would pick alignment one and go with that one. Okay. So the other thing to be aware of with RNA-seq is that obviously you can splice and you frequently do splice mRNA. So here we start with a spliced mRNA and it has two exons, um, a red exon and a blue exon. And when you do your sequencing, you get some reads that come only from exon one and some that come only from exon two, but you'll also get some reads that just by chance happen to cross that boundary. Um, now the problem here is that when you when you align your reads, you align it to a genomic reference genome, and of course that still has the introns in it. So here you can see there's that intron gap between the two exons. So for the red reads and the blue reads if you press the next again, um, that's fairly straightforward. They can align exactly in those two exons. But for these ones that cross the reads, it's a bit more complicated. Um, so we what we need to do is make sure that we, un we use an alignment tool that understands that it's allowed to split the reads like this across the intron. And these are intron spanning reads, and they're actually really important for gene model prediction. So we really want to make sure we include those. So it's important to use a mapping tool that understands that it's using data from spliced RNA and that it's allowed to do this with reads where it's appropriate to do so. OK, next. So just to summarize that, we need to use an alignment tool that is capable of aligning millions of reads to a genome in a reasonable amount of time on a normal computer. And so we use an heuristic, which means that it's good enough, but not perfect. And we need to use a tool that's capable of aligning intron spanning reads. And at the bottom here, I've put the two most common ones that you see in the literature. And in the pipeline that um, you're going to look at today, um, it's HiSat2 that's being used here. OK, so once you've aligned your reads, you can just load them into JBrowse. This is exactly the same screenshot as I showed you before. And as we saw before, you can already tell a lot of things from this. But the problem is that, firstly, you can't really go through and look at every single gene in the genome like this because it would just take you forever. And the other problem is, is that it's not statistically robust. And particularly if you've got um, uh, like multiple replicates, 
it's very hard for you to judge visually how noisy they are and what's going to be statistically valid and what's not. And so in order to um, look at transcript expression globally and do some statistics, what we do is we count how many reads map to each gene. And that gives us a quantitation of this data to play with. So the next step is read counting. And read counting sounds conceptually straightforward, but there are some things to think about here. And that is mostly about whether, whether you want to include reads that overlap the ends of genes, whether you want to include reads that overlap introns, whether you want to include reads that could uh, that that align where two genes are overlapping on opposite strands or whether you want to include reads that could align to two duplicated genes um, as in the bottom one so most commonly what we do is we count any read we count reads that map to exons um, so we're excluding intronic ones um, and we we don't count any reads where the mapping is ambiguous. So if we have this case where genes overlap or where there's gene duplications, we don't count those reads. And that's because you can't really tell which of those genes they originated from. And so you end up double counting for both those genes and inflating everything. So we tend to just rely on the reads we're really sure about and base our calculations off those. OK, next slide. So just to quickly note here that if you have a strand specific library, you can set your counting tool to also be strand specific and that's always worth doing. Um, as we just discussed, you need to decide how you want to count your genes. And also you can think about, do you want to count them per gene, which is robust and easy to analyze, but you don't learn anything about differential isoforms? Or do you want to get a bit more fancy and try to count per transcript or even per exon? And that can allow you to find out more things about um, differential isoform expressions, but it gets much harder interp to interpret. And really to do that properly, you need some kind of um, uh, assembly step as well. So for this workshop workflow today, we're going to talk about counting per gene. And the two most common tools here are at the bottom, HTSeq count and feature count. And the, um, uh, that the workflow you'll be looking at today is using HTC count. Okay, so the next thing we need to do is differential expression. And what we're trying to do here is find transcripts which differ in, in abundance between conditions. And those conditions could be something like a knockdown, knockout or a knockdown versus a wild type, um, different nutrient sources, um, as you can see, I actually wrote this with parasites in mind. So I've written virulent versus avirulent strains, but you know, maybe it may be a vector that has um, a higher prevalence of parasites versus one that, that, that doesn't carry so many. Um, anything like that, you can really go mad and do whatever you want here. We use sequence coverage depth as a proxy for transcript abundance. And we've already looked at how we can visualize that in, in the alignment. And we've talked about how counting the reads mapping to each gene gives us the means to quantify this. But before we can do the statistics, we need to do normalization. And what we're doing here is accounting for the total number of reads sequenced. So if you imagine two samples which are exactly identical to each other, but you sequence 30 million reads from one of them and 60 million reads from the other one, you would expect the reads from the second one to always be double the reads from the first one. So if you do a direct comparison without normalizing, you'll, it'll look like everything is upregulated in that second sample. So we need to normalize to account for the total number of reads sequenced. So if you go to the next slide, this kind of shows what that this looks like. So we've got the same data here. The top left is not normalized and the bottom right is. Um, each each bar is a different sample. And what you're looking at is the distribution of the read counts um, to all of the genes in that sample. And you can see before normalization, this data set was quite noisy. So there's some that have very low abundances and some that have much higher counts. And if you paint on um, an imaginary gene, which is that um, green cross, you can see that in that orange sample, it's up at the third quartile. 
whereas in the purple sample next to it, it's actually down at the first quartile. But yet, because the read count, the total read counts are very different, the absolute value in the purple sample is higher. And so the purpose of normalizing is to bring all those distributions into line. And then you can see properly the relative um, uh, abundance of that transcript in those samples. So now you can see that it's towards the top of the distribution in the orange sample and towards the bottom of the distribution in the purple sample when you compare them. Okay, and finally, we can actually get to the statistical analysis. So the statistical analysis is based on linear modeling and it can be really as complex as you like. It's very common to do simple single factor experiments comparing two conditions. And that would be something like your wild type versus knockout or I don't know, sugar fed versus fed on something else, um, that kind of thing. But you can also do really complex multi-factor experiments involving multiple experimental conditions. Um, the workflow we have in Galaxy really focuses on the single factor experiments. It's important to note that RNA-seq is not normally distributed. Um, most statistical packages assume a, no a negative binomial distribution. And of common distributions, that is the closest fit, but it's not perfect. And so some packages will also transform the data to fit it better to the model. And then we use a, um, a non-parametric test to, to actually compare genes in different samples. And the common tests used are a wall test, which is what DEseq2 uses, or an F test, which is what EdgeR uses. It's also good to know about, I've written log ratio, so I need to change that. It should be a likelihood ratio test. And that's useful for time course analysis as well. And the output for this will be a table. And so for each gene, you get a log twofold change value, which measures the magnitude and the direction of differential expression, a p-value, and an adjusted p-value or a q-value. And to understand that last part, we need to just think very briefly about error types. So there's two types of statistical error, a type two error, which is a false negative, um, which you can think of as something like acquitting a criminal, or a type one error. And type one error is a false positive. Um, an analogy would be convicting an innocent person, and the statistical definition is falsely rejecting a null hypothesis. And the problem with this in science is that it results in false discovery. So you can think you've made some really exciting discovery, and it turns out just to be noise in your data. So we want to minimize type error, one errors as much as possible. So type one errors are inherently linked to the significance level. If you set a p-value cutoff at 0.01, you're accepting that your positive every, that every positive result has a one in a hundred chance of being a false positive. So if you're doing one qPCR in a lab, that's an acceptable risk. But if you're testing 10,000 genes, you actually expect to find a hundred false positives by chance, and that's not acceptable. That 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 gives you false information. And so the Q value is an adjustment of the P values from individual tests to reflect how many tests you're doing um, and, and make sure you get a more sensible answer. And you might see it called the Q value or the adjusted P value or the FDR, but whatever it is, you should always use that and not the raw P value. Okay. So just a quick note to say that most tools for differential expression combine the normalization the transformation and the statistical testing into one package. And you can mix and match them, but if you're not sure what you're doing, it's best to use one package for the whole workflow because then you're sure that everything's compatible. And the com three common ones here, DEseq2, EdgeR, and Limmer. Um, and I think the workflow in Galaxy uses DEseq2. Okay. So the last bit here, this is the workflow in Galaxy that Gloria is going to talk you through in a minute. And all I really wanted to do here is give you a picture of it and show you how it corresponds to this pipeline that we've just walked through. So we can see that we have input samples that go in, they get cleaned up a bit. We run FASTQ, FASTQC on them, sorry, to do quality control. We run Trimomatic to do trimming. We run HiSat2 to do the alignment. 
we run HT seat count to count the reads. And we do that for two samples in parallel or two sets of two conditions in parallel. And then we combine that data in DSeq2 to get your list of differentially expressed genes. And that step also does the normalization as well. OK, so that's really what I wanted to say there. Um, so I will pass back to Gloria and Omar, I think. Um, Catherine, before you go, there is yeah. one question about your presentation. And the question is, there are many types of normalization, TPM, RPGC. Which one do you use? Which one is better? So um, if I'm using something like DEseq2, I will normally just go with whatever DEseq2 is doing because I know that's compatible with its statistical test. Um, the, the main thing to consider is whether you also want to do comparisons within um a sample so if you're comparing if you're if you're comparing if you want to know if you want to sort of rank your genes by abundance you actually need to normalize for gene length as well as for a library size um, and for that you need to make sure that the method you're using takes that into account and so for that tpm is probably the best option um, also just very quickly we have if, if you're used to those kind of metrics, you may have seen RPKM or FPKM in the past, and you may have seen TPM more recently. And the reason why the field has moved from RPKM to TPM is that, that both metrics are based on a ratio. But when you use TPM, the denominator of that ratio is the same in all your samples. So it makes the comparison much easier. Whereas if you're using FPKM, it's not. So you need to be a bit more careful with the comparison in that case. Okay, thank you very much, Catherine. No problem. Okay, so as I said in the beginning, I have uh, three handouts for you today. So the first one is going to walk you through how to uh, set up a vector based account, a, a Galaxy account. And you can have an account in any of the websites, for example, vector based. And once you create your account, how do you actually access uh, Galaxy? You can come here to my workspace, click and get to Galaxy or tools and get to Galaxy. And all this handout is doing is uh, giving you a step-by-step -step process of how to set up that account for the first time. You don't need to do these steps every time, only the first time. And once you do them, every time you click on tools Galaxy, it, it will just come uh, straight to that page continue to Galaxy and you will arrive here. So that's all is covered in the first handout. The second handout uh, is actually telling you how to upload the data to start a workflow. And something very important here that I want you to please keep in mind is that this resource is free. This is not user using your computer or your server, is using uh, our, our servers that we uh, provide via Globus. But we do have a policy of that your data sets will be deleted every 60 days, and that's the fine print you find here at the top of the screen. So if you do want to keep your data for longer than that, please consider downloading your results to your local machine or do a global uh, transfer. And some of these options include things to transfer them to another cloud services. Okay, uh, if you do want to uh, delete and, and permanently delete data sets. So if they are, do not count against your quota, I'm showing you how to do it. So you come here uh, to history options and save histories and do delete permanently. Something else that I wanted to show you is what is the anatomy of uh, Galaxy page. So at uh, the first time you come here, this could be a little bit overwhelming, but uh, this is just where you find the tool. So for example, let's say uh, you are going to use Blast. So you just type a keyword and autocomplete suggestion. What do you want to use? A Blast N, a Blast P. Let's say I'm, I want to use a Blast N. And all you want to do is select the data set from the ones that you have uploaded. I'm going to show you in a minute. and provide all the parameters and click execute. Here is your history pane where you will have 
all the data sets that you have uploaded and the results of the tools that you have run. And as I said in the middle, just to how to set up that. Um, okay, so I'm going to quickly show you how to upload a data set. So I want to uh, just type a keyword. So I'm just going to type EBI because what I'm going to do is get data with BioProject, uh, I sorry, get data via Globus from the EBI server and from a paper or from a bio project, I already have my codes. So I'm going to use this code here and I paste it. And I know from the paper, paper that this is pair N. Oh, sorry, I don't want to do that one. I already did. Uh, so I want to do this one. That is the only one that I'm missing, sorry. And I upload this is pair and I click on execute. And notice the ones that I uploaded earlier for you, I already turned green. And this one is the one that I just submitted and uh, gray means that is waiting to be uploaded to the system. And if I refresh here, soon this uh, should become yellow and later turn green. If there is any issue with the um, up, with me uploading the file, it will turn yellow. While this gets uploaded, I'm going to get a little bit of ahead. So these are all the uh, data sets that I already upload. There's many different types of comparison that you can do. I'm only going to demo one. As Caitlin said, you can do multi-comparisons or just two by two. Okay, so let's pretend all my data sets are already up. And something that I uh, want to do, and here's the, the process that I just demo, is to create a collection with the biological replicates. As you can see here from my studies, I have one, two, three for each one of the samples. So to do the biological replicates, all you need to do is click here on operations on multiple data sets, the icon with a check mark and select the ones. I upload them in order, in the order that I have here in my notepad, so I know which ones they are. So I select the first uh, six, and I said for all the selected samples, I want to build a list of data set pairs, and also from my notepad, I already know which ones they are. So uh, look, notice that this has the same code, 34 and 34, so this one, uh, 34, is, uh, is uh, one, and this one, 36, <clears throat> is um, three, meaning that this one is um, two. Okay, and I'm going to give them a name. So this is the reference column, the susceptible. This study is testing mosquitoes with insecticide, and this is just the susceptible colony. Okay, so I just refresh this here. I'm still uploading the other data set. So notice now that all these uh, samples here are, I already uh, include them in this uh, single collection. And later, once you are done, you are going to end up with as many collections as you create, depending on the number of properties. Okay, now running a workflow in Galaxy per se. This is the screen that Catherine just showed to you. I'm not going to be, go over the steps. She already explained fast QC, Trigomatic, HiSat, uh, HTC count, and DEC2, and more documentation you will find here. Which workflow are we going to run? You come to Globus, to the homepage, and we have these uh, workflows pre configured for you. For the RNA-seq, I'm going to run this one for pair N and stranded because that's, those are the characteristics of the data set that I selected. I click on it. Sorry, it's taking a little bit too long. Okay, good. So what I'm going to do here is just to select my samples. And for that, uh, because this has not loaded yet, I have already pre-loaded that uh, in case it didn't work uh, with this one. Hmm. Uh, pair in and stranded. Hmm. 
Okay, so what I should have had in, in the screen is the possibility to select my collection. So for example, these are the susceptible ones that I just created, the colony, and I want to compare them against any of the other samples. For example, this from Guatemala or from Peru. And those are the collections, right? And later I go step by step and, and check on the parameters that uh, Katrin already explained to you. The only ones that I'm going to mention is that you, you need to make sure that you're selecting the correct genome and that you need to do in two of the programs, HiSat and HTSeq. I'm going to show you. So here by default, because Amoeba starts with A, is the first one chosen. But if I go to vector base, I should be able to select the one that I need. And in this case, I need uh, an uh, albimanus, a stecla, and I need to do that two times for each one of the genomes. Something else that you need to uh, consider is that the feature types and the attributes need to be changed. So if uh, you go to not high sad, but to I, this one, okay, here, to HTSeq, you need to make sure that feature type is to exon and the ID attribute is to gen ID. Why? Because it counts the read in each exon. This means that you are only counting reads in the coding regions. And then it sums the exon counts to give you the number per gene. And the data you get back is one value per gene. Um, and that's all you need to do. So make sure all your genomes are set up to Anopheles, uh, Albimanus, Estecla, check all the, app, all the parameters, and you run the workflow. That's all you need to do. And that's why we give you the background with K3 so you know what uh, all those options mean. Once you click on Run Workflow, you will get a screen like this in green telling you that everything uh, worked fine. And here, uh, I'm just showing you that if you click here uh, in workflow, you can select any of our workflows and import them, the, import them uh, to your own workspace and just edit uh, and do, you know, connect them, disconnect them and learn how the output from one file be from one program becomes the input from another. So I just have some exercises for you to play around and connect and disconnect the data. And here in the appendix is just a refresher of what Katrin already told you, what is the structure of the task view. Okay, uh, so let's pretend that the analysis uh, that we set up, it, it had already finished, and now we are going to analyze it. So we, obtain our files and here I'm going to move this a little bit okay yeah better so at the beginning I have my collection and in the same order in which we have the programs in in the pipeline that's how I'm going to obtain my results so first I have the fast queue groomer which is just making sure I have the correct format for all my files and later I have a fast queue uh, web page which is what uh, Katrin was showing you and she uh, really nicely explained uh, with, with these graphics. So here we can see we have really nice core um, for, for these uh, reads. So I'm not going to go into details because she already explained that. Uh, but the ones you may want to look for FastQ are the ones that are called FastQ web page. And here I show you how to do that step by step. Uh, you can also share your stories. So, for example, I can share this story with you. So, if you want to take a look of actually how the output files uh, look like, I can do that. I can publish that. Or you can share your story with your collaborators if you're writing a paper. You, you have all your results, you check all the files, and now uh, you want to explore the differential expression results. So as Katrin was saying, we, are, we use DEC2, and this has two output files. So one that has the plots, and another one that has the result files, and that's the one uh, we are going to look, the result files. And uh, let me click, if I click here on the eye, I can get view data. So something to notice is that the, to make it easier for the programs to parse the data, they don't give titles 
to the columns, but here they are. This is what each one of these columns mean. And if I click here on this download icon, I get it into my local machine. And I have already done that for you. I have to make things faster. And when you download this file to an open in Excel, for example, the format will be tabular. So you need to change the extension to TXT. And later, I just give you a step by step of how to organize the data. Well, uh, for example, you may want to uh, first organize, sort them based on the log to uh, full change, those one on top. And later, as Katrin said, you don't want to work with the raw p values. You want to work with the adjusted p value with the full discovery rate. So I'm putting at the top all the genes with the best uh, log change and that have the best uh, false discovery rate. And you can do all that manipulation with Excel. And once you do that, you can copy the genes. For example, you can copy the first 100 or something to look how actually that looks in vector base. And how do you do that? So you come to vector base and select gene ID search. And you click here. Oh, <laughs> here, I, because I just did this. So all you need to do is just copy them. So I'm just going to do it again. And you copy the gene IDs, just the first column. I'm just going to reset value so you, you see how I do it. I paste them and I get an answer. So I, you know, I, I got uh, 80 genes, that's what I copy. And what I can do now is just analyze my results. And this is what Omar is going to talk to you about. So I'm not going to uh, go much into detail there. Uh, something else, uh, so we'll come back to this with Omar. Something else that you can do is export your data uh, to ViewPath, and you can export both your RNA-seq counts, and you can export the BigWig files, which you can uh, visualize in our genome browser. So you need to do, uh, you need to go back to Galaxy and run uh, and something and that will, so the initial part of the workflow, actually I run it overnight, it does not run fast. But the second part of the workflow, it will be something uh, much quicker. And all you need to do is find all the HTC count files. And to do that, as I said here in, in, in the handout, you just type HTC count, and you will find uh, the data that matches that. There is uh, loading. Oops, sorry. Maybe because I, I hide uh, the file. Ah, oh, yes, sorry. Those files are hidden. So the first thing that I need to do, uh, I come here, save histories. Okay, so I have some hidden files here. So the first thing that I need to, uh, to do is show those files that are hidden. And now I can search for HDC count on data and select the ones that I want. I do not want the ones that say no feature, that's not what I want. I do not want the, to select the ones that are collection. I just want to select the files that say HTC count on data. So I select those and just follow these steps. And once you select them all, uh, you come for all the selected, I'm going to uh, build a data set list. And what you will obtain is what I have here on the top. Uh, that I have a uh, call, I'm, I'm going to hide this again. And I have here all the gene counts. That's how I have named that. Later, you are going to do exactly the same steps, but with the big WIC files. They are the ones you can load in VectorBase uh, genome browser. And here I have created another collection, all my big WICs, and I have given this. And you are going to run another step that is uh, how to convert that to TPM. So you come here to View Path Export Tools and you click on RNA seq uh, HTC count, HTC um, count to TPM. 
and you are going to send that to be able to manipulate your data uh, in vector base. And it's just going to ask you which data set is the one that you are going to send to vector base. So you said all my big wigs I want to send and all my gene counts I want to send to vector base. And once uh, you do that, that is going to appear here in uh, my workspace, my data sets. And these are what I'm being exporting. For example, this one that I'm just doing, Guatemala versus Peru, that I, I'm working with Anopolis albumins. And if I click on this data set, so I'm going to obtain all the details of what I did. I can run uh, a search, in this case, a full, uh, a full change search. And this is something that we already covered in a previous webinar, if you're not familiar with this. So I can compare my Peru samples, and those are going to be my reference against my Guatemala samples. And I can change the full change. So I don't want two, I want, I don't know, uh, four, and, and I can set all these parameters. And also, you can visualize uh, the data in the genome browser. So with the link that we have here to visualize, these are the big big files that will be exported, and this is how it, what you have. So I run a little bit through it to give you time, Omar. So all yours. Okay, great, not a problem. Um, I was uh, I was frantically answering questions, uh, typing questions as you were talking. So. <laughs> So hopefully I did not miss anything important. Uh, let's see. So I'll make myself the presenter. Okay. Hopefully you can see vector base right now. Yes, I can. Okay. Perfect. Um, okay. Thanks, Gloria. That was obviously a, a quick tour uh, through. Um, well, first from Catherine on uh, you know uh, RNA seq alignment and differential expression, and then from Gloria, quick tour of our Galaxy tools. Uh, one thing to point out is that if you go to the main um, Use Galaxy website, uh, you will notice that uh, it looks uh, very different from, uh, or looks different from the version we have, and that's because um, our current installation is an older version of Galaxy. But we are working on updating this, and hopefully in the next month or so, we should have a new, or maybe two months, a new version of uh, Galaxy rolled out, uh, which will come with many other tools. There were some questions about. That being able to run, for example, single cell pipelines or workflows, and those uh, hopefully we'll be able to put them together and make them available then. Um, but the, the biggest thing is to make sure we update to the latest version, which has many new features and some things that are a bit more uh, streamlined and, and more intuitive to use, in, in my opinion. Um, okay, so as, as Gloria showed you, she ran an RNA-seq analysis. I have one here as well. This is not the same one that she did. I was just comparing male and female Anopheles uh, stavensi. And um, it's a differential expression, very simple um, um, two-factor uh, comparison. And uh, going through, as Catherine uh, showed you, we have, and, and Gloria, we have all these, all these different um, uh, steps. In the end here, um, we have the um, uh, DE-seq steps, and these are the ones that include the information about your differential expression. Um, there are two key files here. One file is, um, if you just click on these, it, uh, open, it tells you what it is. So this file is 3.6 megabytes, and it's a, it's a PDF, right? And, uh, and so that means you can view it. Uh, and this shows you um, um, the information about your differential expression, and uh, it gives you some information about how good and how robust your differential expression is. And so we didn't cover this in this webinar, but maybe in a future webinar, we might take a deeper dive into this. If people are interested, that will take an entire webinar just going through this. Um, but the second DEseq output, or a second, another DEseq output, is a tabular file, which, which um, Gloria mentioned. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you to a, another way of analyzing your data. So I downloaded the tabular file, opened it in Excel, just like uh, Gloria did, and I, I sorted the file based on um, uh, uh, both the, the uh, log full change and the p-value. So I'm, I'm making sure I'm picking up the ones that are most um, um, uh, I trust most in terms of, uh, and obviously I'm looking at the Q value here as, as Catherine indicated. So the last column here is the Q value, which would be more uh, robust statistically. 
Um, so I took these upregulated ones. I'm just going to copy these gene IDs, and I'm going to go back to uh, my browser and back to VectorBase. And the question is, oh, can I take these gene IDs now and put them in VectorBase and, and do more analysis with this? And, and this same tool applies to any of the ViewPath TV sites. So I'm just going to go here. And you know, if you've never been to the site, you'll be thinking, well, I wonder if they have a tool to search for IDs, right? So I'm just going to start typing the word ID. And sure enough, under annotation curation identifiers, you can search for gene IDs. I'm going to click on this. This gives you a, uh, a search window. Um, and I'm going to uh, copy and paste all my IDs in here. Um, they just have to be separated by either a space, a comma, or a new line. Uh, in fact, you can have a, a list of IDs and, and none IDs in there. As long as they are separated by a delimiter, um, the, they will be picked out and recognized by the system uh, in most cases. Um, so now I click on Get Answer. And what this does, it now generates a step in my strategy. This is my, my, my in silico experiment now that I can build. And there were 133 genes that I selected. And now you can actually, uh, so these are 133 genes that are uh, Anopheles Stevensi genes. Um, the gene IDs are in the database. And so that's why we're able to return them. One thing to be aware of is that if the gene model, the gene annotation itself changes, um, then it's, uh, it's possible that you may have um, some annotations that are gene IDs that become obsolete or they get merged with a second one. And so that's something to keep an eye on. So if you know you had 150 gene IDs in your list, then when you do the search, you only come back with 140, for example, then there are 10 missing, right? And the question is, and most likely those will be because of an annotation issue or or could be an issue with an ID. But definitely contact us if you run into issues like that so we can, we can help you. So you can analyze your data in different ways. I can add steps, right? I can ask, for example, how many of my, my genes have a predicted secretory signal peptide, right? So I can combine this with another search. I can search for things with a signal peptide. Uh, let's spell it right. Signal peptide. Um, and I'm intersecting my results. So I have a search in the past, which was my 133 genes. And now I'm going to search for genes with a, a signal peptide. And I'm going to uh, select the Stefensi genomes that we have and run this search. And if any of these have a predicted secretory signal peptide, I, I don't know the answer to that. But if they do, then they will show up here. And it turns out there are 58 genes that have a predicted secretory signal peptide. So this is a nice way to start exploring your data uh, using the, the different searches that are available in, in VectorBase. So going back to my first step here, which is the 133 genes, another way of, of exploring this data is to examine enrichment in this data. And, and you can do this in different ways. Um, so as long as you have terms in your in your uh, file that you can enrich on then you you can do an enrichment um, and an enrichment basically all you're doing and I do have I will show a couple of slides here just um, so it, it's easier to understand um, but basically in your list of genes you may find things that are that are upregulated and interesting and as you look at them you might might find things like uh, that are that are clear functions like a DNA polymerase or gyrase but obviously, looking at these by eye and eyeballing them is, is hard. And secondly, you just don't know if these genes are in there by random, right? So maybe genes involved in DNA replication are enriched in your, in your drug-resistant uh, line, right? Uh, but, but, how, but you can't tell this just by uh, eyeballing it. The second key thing that's important for being able to do enrichment is you want things to be uh, properly um, uh, described in the database. And so you could rely on the annotation, right? But a gene could be called, um, you know, uh, uh, a gyrase in in one, um, uh, you know, in one sample, another, or in, in one genome, and another genome. It's not a gyrase. It's maybe called a, a, a whatever, uh, um, a polymerase five. You know, whatever. You can give. You can imagine that genes can be, or functional genes can be given different names depending on who did the annotation. And that's why there is um, uh, the Go Consortium, which actually uh, uh, puts together a, um, a knowledge base, basically, of um, everything in biology, basically. And so it's a gene ontology. And it divides the gene ontology into three arms, molecular function, cellular component, and, um, and uh, biological process. Each of these uh, uh, attempts to describe certain aspects of uh, the gene ontology, so um, molecular function, 
talks about the activity of the at the molecular level. So for example, a toxin activity or a catalytic activity. Cellular component tells you where the function takes place. For example, in the cilium, right? So that the proper description here would be cilium for anything that takes place in the cilium and so forth. Um, and the other one is whether um, uh, this process is accomplished by multiple activities. For example, pyrimidine by biosynthesis, for example. And the relationships in this tree, so this tree will go on, you know, down to the basement, and and the relationships in this tree are hierarchical, right? And 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 that's also an important factor. And in this case, if you're doing a goal enrichment analysis, you're simply asking, or very simply asking, um, which term in my list occurs um, more frequently than you would expect uh, by by sort of random chance, right? And most uh, the, the most straightforward way of doing that is doing a Fisher's exact test. Um, but again, as um, Catherine indicated, and I won't go through this in detail because Catherine already did a good job of showing the importance of that in, in differential expression, but you face the same issue. If you have 100 genes and you're, you're, you're setting your cutoff at p-value of 0 0.01, then you could have a 1 in 100 false discovery rate or false, false positive rate, right? Um, but if you have 10,000 genes or 10,000 go terms, which, which you will have in, in a genome, then now you have potentially 100 false positives. And of course, the more uh, numbers you have, the more tests you run, basically, the, more, the, the higher the possibility of getting um, errors in your, in your analysis. And that's why you do the uh, multiple uh, test corrections. And so again, in the output files, you will see a p-value, which comes out of the Fisher's exact test, but you will also see a, a uh, FDR value, um, Bonferroni, uh, for example, and those would uh, be the ones to actually focus on when you're looking at your analysis. There are a couple of caveats to point out here. So one is that uh, the Go enrichment um, relies on the Go term assignments, uh, and, and they have to be accurate, right? And if they're not accurate, then you're going to get errors in there. So that's something for you to be aware of. So as a scientist, you always should take a look at that and say, well, do these make sense? Um, the second thing to note is that the Go term assignments are not complete. So not every gene in the genome has a Go term assigned to it. And so, um, and so this means that there will be functions that are not annotated with a Go term that will be missing from your analysis. So that's always a, a, a caveat of, of these uh, enrichment analyses. They have to, of course, it depends on the completeness of your, of your data. And so back to vector base, I'm here, I have my 133 genes that are upregulated in females in this case. Um, and so I may be interested in analyzing these results using enrichment. And we have a nice uh, section here where you can, um, you can, well, actually there are two things here. You can view your genes on the genome, right? So this is a very quick way to paint the genome. And depending, of course, how your genome is, is um, 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 assembled, you may have chromosomes, you may not have chromosomes, but you can quickly see if there's any kind of interesting clustering of the genes. This is not, not statistical, but simply uh, visual. Um, and then I can click on Analyze Results, and let me just close this filter here. So I can click on Analyze Results, and you'll notice you have three types of enrichments available to you, and, and we're, we'll continue adding new analyses to this section here as we, as we develop them. Um, one is a Go enrichment. We have a metab metabolic pathway enrichment. It works essentially the same way as the Go enrichment, but instead of using Go terms, it's using enzyme commission numbers, um, which are, are, are proper descriptions of, um, of enzymes. Uh, and then finally, we have a word enrichment, which takes the names of the genes, the product descriptions, and also runs a Fisher's exact test on that. Um, and, and the idea behind there is that you could potentially find some functions that are properly described in their names, but don't have Go terms, and you may tease them out here. So that's a, one way to, um, to get to, the, uh, to those genes without, without Go terms. So it's useful to run as well. Today, I'm just going to demo a, a Go term or gene ontology enrichment. So you click on this button here, and once you click on this, you're offered uh, an option, a couple of options here. Obviously, we were in Anopheles Stevensi, so this uh, is the option you have. You're going to be comparing the Go terms of your 133 genes uh, here with all the Go terms in um, in this particular genome. That's your background. I can pick which arms of the Go ontology I want I want to um, uh, analyze. And I would recommend doing all three when you do these, so one by one. Um, your evidence, where are the Go terms coming from, whether it is computed or curated, 
Uh, curated means that there was an annotator who works annotating the genome and they actually manually assigned a go term to a, um, a gene. And the computed is where we actually uh, run a tool called Interpro scan to go So any domain, functional domain assigned to a gene uh, can be associated with a go term and we, we make that linkage and, and pull them in. Um, this uh, computed versus curated is very, it's kind of a gray area because many of the curated ones end up being transferred from, from PFAM domains. So I typically just select both. It, it, I don't find that this makes a, a huge difference. And the computed ones are fairly robust because they're based on interpro domains. And so that's, that's quite good. Um, you can limit your Go terms to either a, 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 a Go Slim terms or not. Uh, the Go Slim is basically a collapsed version. You remember I told you that the Go terms are hierarchical. Um, and so you can, um, uh, but there are many, right, in the hierarchy. So you can collapse these just to the broad categories like um, molecular function or membrane for, uh, function. And, and that's a way to maybe reduce the noise a little bit. Um, I typically run this with, um, with the full um, gene ontology uh, first and then see what I get in my results. You can set the P cutoff value if you want. I typically leave this at the default of 0.01, and then you just click on Submit. When you click on Submit, it's gonna give you a cue here that it's it's running a, a gene enrichment, and then once it's done, it gives you the results right here, and so it's a table. You see here that you have a, a GoTerm ID. It tells you the GoTerm, so proteolysis is right here, uh, how many genes in the background. Before I start looking at these in detail, I quickly just look at the right-hand side here and say, okay, well, are these statistically significant? And it looks like a couple of these, maybe the top one is. And so that's great. So I can say, well, maybe this up here, proteolysis, seems to be enriched in my, uh, my female, uh, in the upper gay genes in the female ones, even though I see other um, things down here that seem to relate to uh, female uh, insects or mosquitoes. So that's great. That tells me that that I, I, this is potentially this experiment has some differential, uh, differential regulated genes that are interesting, but you can do this for any of these arms. So I can run this and then and submit again, and then you can now see for cellular component if you have something that is uh, enriched there and of interest and worth pursuing further. And so you look here, the enrichments are not that great. So you maybe you say, well, maybe not here, molecular function, submit, and those run fairly, fairly quickly. Um, so the last thing I think I will highlight here is that you can take these results. Oh, and uh, actually two things. One is, uh, because of the interest of time, I'm not going through every single column here, but you can click on the little um, icon here, the question mark, and you get some more information. Most of these are self-explanatory. Um, for example, the top one here, uh, I can see that um, there are 18 out of 421 Go terms in the background, and I can go and get those 18. So let's say I want to see um, I mean, let's actually take a look down here. It looks like hyd serine hydrolase activity is enriched, right? And, and, and I believe serine uh, peptidases or hydrolases are um, uh, upregulated in female um, insects. And so I can go ahead and say, well, I wonder what these are. I can click on the 10 right here. This will run a new search and it'll return um, my, the results of the 10 genes. And so, so remember my first search was up here. This is my new search. And now I can look at those 10 genes specifically if I wanted to. Um, let's go back to this search right here. And the last thing I'm gonna say is that when you're looking at your, um, uh, your Go enrichment, one thing you can do is uh, uh, take these Go terms to um, other resources. And we have a link to Revigo, which is a popular uh, visualization tool for um, Go enrichment. So if I click on this, it will take this to the Revigo page, which will just post um, in their um, submission uh, window, the Go terms with their statistical values from the previous search. You can play around with the parameters. They have a lot of helpful resources and you can start Revigo. And then this will give you various ways to interact with the data, graphical, um, a graphical interface. Um, and what I like a lot here is they actually give you the, the breakdown of the hierarchy. So you can see, for example, that peptidase activity includes the serine peptidase activity, the metalloprotease activity, and the peptidase, and, and so forth. So you can tell that all of these belong together under the one uh, goal hierarchy. Um, so I think this is where I was going to, going to stop. Um, e, uh, Gloria, was there anything I missed that you wanted me to cover? No, I think we did just good. And because we started uh, 
like 15 minutes past the hour is you know <laughs> we are just uh finishing which is about time great so thank you very much omar and catherine for presenting i see no more questions but if you do have questions please remember to click on contact us uh, and send us a message we will be more than happy to to help you thank you very much to all the people that attend the this mini series with the four events we look forward to seeing you in our other webinars and um, the next one will be for our uh, release uh, webinar and uh, which will be in july i believe and thank you very much see you next time all right bye-bye everybody